Uh, the topic is uh, new technologies. The topic was assigned to me for crop irrigation with special reference. And I said the mitigation emissions from rice cultivation. And as a matter of fact, originally I really wanted to focus only on mitigation, but the recent events in the Philippines, you know, about the typhoon that triggered for me that to rethink that a bit. And I took the liberty of adding a bit on terms of, uh, of typhoon effects and also the way how it how it uh, uh, affects uh, how irrigation potentials and what can be done on that. So, um, yeah, so it's about irrigation and rice and uh, what are the links to climate change. It's twofold. One is the way to reduce emission rates, greenhouse gas emission, GHG is a very common acronym. I think many of you will be familiar with it. But on the other hand, of course, we can see also irrigation rise in the way that it buffers drought, for example. It's an adaptation to coping with climate extremes. So first about mitigation. Um, rice is a very specific crop in many ways. One feature is that rice is predominantly flooded. And that has a number of implications on the carbon and also on the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so because of the exclusion of oxygen in the soil, there is an anaerobic process, anaerobic decomposition, which leads to the formation of methane, CH4. CH4 is a very important greenhouse gas, 21 point, uh, times higher than CO2, some new estimates say even a factor of 25. And that is emitted from rice and not from other crops such as wheat, which makes it really unique. But there's also then the emission of nitrous oxide, which is basically emitted from any crop that receives fertilizer. And uh, so it is usually say, saying we're saying that the emission is not from rice specific, so it comes from soils. N2O is, has an even more potent greenhouse gas. In fact, there is a, around the global warming potential, as we call it, is around 300. But then this N2O doesn't come in that huge quantities from rice. So to a large extent, when we talk about emission, it's really about methane emission. So how important is that in the total? Well, rice accounts, as you can see it here, roughly speaking, for 1.5% of all sources. That doesn't sound very much, but then you have to see that even thinking about the aircraft industry, they're also saying uh, that they are not so small because they are only less than 2%. And so, so far, if we go down that way and say, okay, it's only small, and then would probably for any of these sources, when we bring it down, we would, we would come up with a very small number, so it wouldn't be worth to, to do something. You can see it here, that's quite often that together that also from other agricultural sources, as I said, is N2O to some extent also. It's also methane from, from livestock. Uh, it's uh, in, in the range of 12 percent additionally and then you have then all the deforestation which is here called the forestry sector, uh, 17 percent. So that's what we quite often see as these numbers, about 30 percent, which comes from, from land use. So there are different ways how to aggregate it. However, of course, for individual countries, this is the global estimate, the, the percentage can be much higher. So. Just a few examples. Uh, these are numbers that are taken from the national communication to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So every country, every signatory, and basically all countries of the world have signed that UNFCCC, uh, the, the, the Framework Con Convention, is obliged to submit so-called national communications in certain intervals. And these national communications do have something which is called an emission inventory. And these are the numbers that I took from these national communications. These are not my numbers. These are official numbers submitted to, by, by your government, in this case, in the case of, of, of India, to, to the UNFCCC. So at the upper scale, basically, you have a country like Vietnam, although I have to say the way how they calculated uh, the, these, these emissions was rather simplistic, I have to say. Uh, so probably the number is a bit too high, but nevertheless, it will be high. So they came up with almost 25% of the total emissions of Vietnam coming only from rice.
Uh, so the, the India has, uh, has submitted the national communications quite recently and they were very good, very detailed, very well documented. I can really just recommend it to you <coughs> to, to download them from, from the internet. And they came up with an estimate that's about 4.7% of the emissions, of all emissions of India coming from rice. Indonesia I have cited because it's quite an interesting example. You can see the, the uh, megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent are just almost as high as Vietnam, but then the, uh, the percent of the total is so, so much smaller. How is that possible? Well, Indonesia has a lot of emission coming from deforestation. So that basically is just a question of the percentage that really dwarfs the emissions coming from rice. But nevertheless, you can really see that for those countries, it is, of course, a sizable amount. And uh, it is worthwhile to think about possible ways how to reduce it. And we have done this since the 80s, actually, working on, on emission measurements. Uh, also, when Swapan was at, at Erie, he has seen these automated uh, systems that we're using in, uh, in, in diff have, have been using in different countries. We also had a network of stations. And I have uh, installed two stations in, um, in, in India, one in, in Delhi and one in Katek. Uh, so automated measurements, but very often nowadays we're really using manual measurements, as you can see there, in the way of, of Vietnam, because it's cheaper and more flexible, and it still gives us reasonable, um, <coughs> reasonable estimates, allows reasonable estimates of, of emissions. Uh, there are different approaches now, of course. Technology is improving, so we also have now other type of sensors, how to measure it. Uh, which is a, makes the whole thing a bit easier to handle. And nowadays we are working more and more with eddy covariance techniques, so meaning that we have towers set up in rice fields and where we can, can measure mainly carbon dioxide and uh, water vapor and, and heat fluxes. That was they were originally uh, designed for, but now there are some sensors available that allow us also to measure methane. So there are a number of measurements that, that are around there. Of course, you can always argue it's not enough. But nevertheless, the key question, uh, but nevertheless, we, we have, we, we're not starting from scratch. But the key question, of course, is how could we reduce it? And one of the ways to reduce it, as I said already, water management is very important. The water cover, in fact, is the prerequisite that we get methane. So we can play around with the water cover and really try to reduce this. And one option is called alternate wetting and drying, basically meaning that we have rice field flooded for some time, which can be around one week, and then the rice field is, is without flooding. And we can make sure, with some very simple techniques, as I said here, that there is still some water in the soil. Basically, the idea is that we monitor the water in the soil, and then at a certain threshold, then the, the rice field is flooded again. Uh, there are different synonyms for that. Different countries have, have their own way. Basically, it's always the same story. You can also call it intermittent flooding, draining. Some people call it controlled irrigation, single, multiple flooding, draining. So different ways. So it's always the same idea, basically, to reduce the, the duration of flooding. And that was developed to reduce irrigation water consumption. So you can see here, it does not affect the yield at the left side, but it brings down the amount of irrigation water. And that is really, of course, an important point in many countries. We have heard already how important in the globally, and even for India, that, that, that about 70% of the water use is going into irrigation. Uh, so that is really something which, which would be sizable, could be very useful, but we have found out that it also reduces the emissions substantially. You can really see it here now. CF stand, it stands for continuously flooding, so the way how it's traditionally done. There's an experiment in the Philippines in the province called Tarlac. And the other one is alternate wetting and drying. We usually see a small, a very small increase in the N2O emission. That is, it could be very high if we are giving excess of fertilizer, but of course we try to also to, to, to put it in a way that's thing, the fertilizer amount, you can really see in the, the enormous way, uh, amount of, of methane that is really reduced by it. So we really bring down the potential. However, we also had some, this, uh, when some non-success there or failures in some of our programs where AW has been introduced to the farmers. So they were basically in our list assigned as, as, uh, as AWD farmers. But as you can see, the effect was zero in some other places where they have uh, been, uh, where so, and, and we went back to those guys in the 
the, the province called Nueva Exija. We went back to the people and asked them, so what happened? They said, well, okay, some time ago they showed us how it works, but we haven't done it because they get their water free from the canal. It's gravity in, in, in irrigation, no incentive to do it, whereas the other ones in Tarlac, they had to pump, they had to pump groundwater. So they were very interested to save water because they have less fuel. Basically, the farmer has to buy the diesel, brings it to, to an operator who puts it into a pump, and then he gets it. So there, it really depends very much on the situation you're in, and we really have to see that uh, as a potential, but it's not going by itself. Obviously, we really have to still work to convince farmers or, or creating new incentives. We're doing a lot of uh, sort of... Uh, uh, training courses, we're introducing this technique, so in a number of places, not may, at the moment now a lot of work is done both in Vietnam and, and in, in, in the Philippines, and uh, to really to try to convince the farmers. There is also now, hopefully, a possibility to even get some carbon credits for that. Uh, we have been working with Bayer Crop Science to develop, uh, to, to uh, get approval for a clean development mechanism approved baseline methodology. So you can't, you won't be able to read that. Uh, what, what is the fine point? I just wanted to give it, make it a bit more authentic looking that you can really see it is on the web. You can look at it. So it's a technique called methane emission uh, reduction by adjusted water management and rice. Uh, so it's now the, uh, it's in fact already now the third version at the moment around. And uh, basically that explicitly refers to alternate wetting and drying uh, method and aerobic rice cultivation. Aerobic rice would be without any water cover uh, that they are uh, really covered in this um, in this, uh, this, this, with this, this kind of, of uh, baseline methodology. So in principle, the, uh, it would be possible to get carbon cred credit for, um, uh, for, for a project like this. Having said that, the returns will be very small because the area per farmer is really, really small. So in so far, you cannot really see that as something to get for farmers to get out of poverty. Could be something, for example, if you look at, at the level of an irrigation administration, that you have a big area where you can really think think about uh, where you get a lot of uh, where you can can have a lot of hectare, and then obviously also get more returns from that. Maybe using it to improve irrigation to allow this kind of of uh, um, uh, alternate wetting and drying. There are a lot of obstacles. Uh, for this CDM, clean development mechanism, one is many stakeholders, so a lot of transaction costs. There are very unclear guidelines, and we're working a lot on that, on measurement, reporting, and verica verification, because you really have to prove that things are done. And uh, the whole problem now is really that we have, have it now, everything is now based per area unit. So you have to reduce it according to the UNFSC, uh, a certain amount per, per have, have to reduce, to reduce uh, emissions per area. So in other words, if you take the water and double the area and you double your rice production, the emission savings will be zero because they say, yeah, this is, this is just a leakage. You're just using it for something else. So it doesn't make much sense, actually. If you send the water to, let's say, to, 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 a, to a city, then it's fine. But if you use it for rice again, then it's, it's not good because you're getting emissions. So we really think that we have to rethink the whole thing and have to, to really th say now f uh, production scaled emissions, saying we, we, we report emissions. Uh, are, are also uh, other players are also interested to have something like the with, with kind of labeling that you have for organic farming. We're talking a bit about the future now. We don't have it yet, but we also have it for forest conservation. So why not having anything like that for footprint? Because that would really, I think, be, become, could could become a real game changer. Because that, then we would have a very strong interest to to um, to really uh, reduce emissions from from uh, also from. Uh, uh, very important player here, the private sector. Uh, at the government scale, there is now the development of NAMA, Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions. So as we speak here, there is, of course, this COP conference in Warsaw this, 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 uh, this, this year, where they also are discussing about the NAMAs. Uh, the NAMAs are uh, some kind of voluntary engagement, uh, country engagement proposals, so countries are free to have a one or have, have this plan or not, but they are expected to become the main vehicle for mitigation action in developing countries. The whole CDM 
probably we have to see that as a very as, as something that doesn't really fit well to the land use sector. The, the clean development mechanism is, is quite okay for big comp for big industries or things like that. It also works quite well in the, for for biogas, um, but it's difficult to see it really this kind of project based uh, um, mitigation actions to really be, become a. a, a widespread and have a widespread adoption. But nevertheless, um, so here with the NAMAS, it would be that the countries are getting, are having, having some programs to reduce emissions irrespective of, of the individual projects and it's not necessarily a carbon carbon accrediting is just say to prove that, that it's like this. So there are a lot of plans that it may become a big one, but who knows about that. I really don't, uh, it, it's really difficult. However, we really see some countries who are already picking up on that particularly Vietnam, uh, really they didn't want to hear anything about, uh, about the uh, uh, mitigation before, but now they have a, gov a, a decision by the Prime Minister, it is, I just read it for you, you know what is read there, the target of reducing greenhouse gas emission compared to 2005 uh, level is 20%. So they call it 2020-20 because a 20% reduction, 20% increase, increase in emission uh, by the year 2020s, and they explicitly mention also things like alternate wetting and drying. That is now triggering down to different to the uh, provincial level. So the province. Uh, governments are now rather clueless at the moment and also have been asking us, so what should we actually do? But they have really these clear targets to, to bring down the emissions. So it's quite, quite a remarkable change, I, I, I would say. Um, of course, we want to also, as I said already, combine that with uh, in a, uh, not see, see the, the water management as an isolated factor. We want to combine it with more efficient crop management in general, something that is also here on the fertilizer side, something that's called site-specific nutrient manager, which basically says that the, that the nutrients should be applied when needed and the total amount should be adjusted to season and location. And we're doing that now more and more by mobile phone applications. So there is already so-called rice crop manager, which is based on mobile phone application. And we are now expanding that with a new module, which is looking into greenhouse gas emission calculation and uh, also climate adjusted target yields so that we have the whole now called the climate informed rice crop and low emission manager to really broaden this, this concept and also to, to find ways how to bring it to to uh, to from it. Okay, so a bit about the the uh, 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 the the effect of the typhoon. About one of the key points is the is the lodging of of rice, and uh, we are doing measurements with an instrument that's called rice blaster. Because what we realized, what also the farmers tell us, that this is the alternate wetting and drying. Uh, gives, gives more root growth, and so we have a better lodging resistance in that. So that's really the kind of thing. And so we really see that as, as one way that we can bring AWD also as a, that not only just saying it doesn't harm the, the, the yield, that's probably not enough. We really have to bring to the farmer some kind of incentive to really do it. So I just uh, had, had, had um, uh, just as I said, just put it in now, a few, uh, uh, two, two, three slides about, about the typhoon effects. And I co compared the one they are now on uh, when, when a typhoon, like in the, the Sangshan in 2006, hits an archipelago, meaning islands, or hits, hits an, uh, uh, a continental area, which is in this case uh, Myanmar, but would be very similar also, let's say, in, in Orissa. You can see that, that the, uh, the wind speeds, uh, the, the track over land, is much longer over an, over an archipelago because basically it, it doesn't really it doesn't really, really leave the, 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 the ocean you can see here it is really always on the ocean so it's always fueled with a lot of lot of um, uh, a hot hot of en hot en with a lot of energy whereas it overland of course it subsides however here in this case the area affected by salinity really diverges a lot here we had a Delta uh, uh, and, uh, and so far uh, the Irrawaddy date Delta and, and so and so far was a lot of salinity problems here so and so we have to see about different ways how to get it adjusted both to submergence and um, so and the other ones here is about Delta maybe I just got, go through that over a bit more.
quickly. So in Vietnam, we have that problem where, where, uh, where the deltas are affected. And we have it in Myanmar and also Bangladesh. And we could also have here, of course, some deltas in, in, in India, both on, on the Ganges as well as Manadi. And uh, yeah, so we need to tolerance against flying. We also need tolerance against salinity as an important way how to, how to get those, um, the, <coughs> to get adjusted to the, uh, to the effects of typhoon. And the key message here is we rather like to look into where are, do we already have those problems? What are the geographic hotspots at the moment? We talked a lot about climate variability. We can also see it in terms of the stress variability that is exactly existing to find, to identify the hotspots where to go. So in conclusion, uh, irrigation is an important factor in determining both the emission potential as well as the resilience, no doubt about that. Uh, in turn, also the improved irrigation is a very promising option for mitigation and adaptation in rice fields. The, however, we really have to see that the beneficial effects of irrigation are often impaired by extreme events, for example, this kind of, of weather hazards, so that we cannot see that alone only as, as, as irrigation. Just improving irrigation probably won't really help that much. It has to go hand in hand with a number of other measures. For example, uh, stress tolerant rice varieties that are really to, to come to an overall to comprehensive uh, adaptation that is really last but not least. Uh, not, not last but not least, we really think that the recent, looking at the recent climatic stream, as opposed to always thinking about that we need that, that, that we, we need some, some fancy climate models, just looking at where do we have the problems at the moment can really be taken as an entry point for identifying geographic hotspots for needed interventions in given rice systems. 